I think the long arc of time points towards this this becoming relevant on a global scale. It's already relevant for people, right? It's it's, it's relevant for individual Nigerians, individual Argentinians, individual uh, people in Lebanon. It, it, it's already kind of a you know global money for people. But I think that you know people expecting that to happen in a year or two or three, it's premature. Hey guys, welcome back to Let's Talk Crypto. In today's video, Lynn Alden who is one of crypto's favorite macro commentators, discusses the developments of the last few weeks to help us navigate these chaotic waters, and reevaluate the dollar's role in the world. Regarding the banking crisis, Lynn believes some of the smaller banks are still facing liquidity problems, as the Federal Reserve has been pulling liquidity out of the markets. However, Lynn notes that liquidity conditions have changed as the Fed approaches its peak in rate hikes, and that's obviously relevant for markets like gold and Bitcoin. Lynn also points out that the general trend in gold will continue, as countries like the BRICS nations move away from the dollar and diversify their money allocations. Lynn believes that the US dollar is losing its supremacy as a reserve currency, and that we will likely see a multi-currency world, but even though some countries are abandoning the dollar, people still want it. When it comes to Bitcoin, the digital gold, Lynn considers it to be a form of tail risk insurance, and more useful than gold due to its portability. But could it replace the US dollar as the world's reserve currency? Let's listen to Lynn's take on this as she shares some guidance on how to best diversify our portfolio to protect our wealth in these uncertain times. But before we do, please consider subscribing to our channel, as we bring you daily content on the latest crypto news. And now, let's jump right into the video. I think the net impact is that small and medium uh, or niche banks are going to be under profitability pressure for quite a while. Some of them still have ongoing liquidity or solvency concerns. Some of the largest banks are pretty much in good shape. They don't really have the same types of risks. Uh, and that's kind of the arrangement that they're in. The Fed has been pulling liquidity out of the market uh, you know, over the course of the past year. And I think they've kind of run into roughly, roughly the limit of how much they can pull out. And so, you know, their balance sheet has been down for a year. I think it's probably going to be sideways-ish for a period of time. Um, you know, whether it has to shoot up again will depend on if there's another shoot to drop, another sort of like liquidity crisis. It's, it's partially, uh, you know, psychological, uh, basically whether or not humans do a bank run or, or not do a bank run. So some of that's unpredictable, but I think the general base case is for somewhat of a more sideways liquidity. Mm -hmm. And I think rates, you know, they might get a little higher. Uh, but I think the rate of change is slowing down and they're kind of getting closer to their their peak. And that, you know, that's relevant for for markets. It's obviously relevant for liquidity sensitive assets, uh, you know, Bitcoin, gold, other assets like that. Um, and it's, it's, you know, generally pro equity when it happens. But I think a lot of that might be behind us now. I think particularly liquidity sensitive assets, um, it's generally a plus for them. And so we can kind of divide the economy into almost like two sections. There's ones that are interest rate sensitive. And that includes obviously real estate due to how leveraged it is. And it also includes unprofitable tech companies because they, they're reliant on issuing equity at very high valuations, which is easier to do when interest rates are zero and harder to do when interest rates are 5%. Um, and, and so basically those are the two areas that have been under pressure. I think they're going to continue to be under pressure. And then there's a bunch of things in the middle, uh, like manufacturing uh, and other things like that that have shown deceleration, but not to the same degree that you've seen in say real estate or unprofitable tech. And to the extent that the market is pricing in kind of a top in terms of Fed rates, um, you know, maybe the first half of this year, uh, maybe a bottom in liquidity, that's generally good for, say, scarce ads that don't have to worry about profits. You know, historically, that'd be gold. Now it's Bitcoin and similar assets where those types of things don't really have to worry about recession, but they do have to worry about liquidity conditions. And those have changed. General trend, um, I think, is that the gold trend is probably going to continue ever since it has since 2009. So uh, especially kind of BRICS nations will be more likely to want to hold more gold than less gold. So I think that that, that ratio will keep inching higher. Um, the, the yuan is starting from a very small base, um, but I, I think it's generally going to increase somewhat. I don't think it'll be anywhere near the dollar anytime soon, but it, the fact that it comes off zero diversifies things somewhat, both in terms of payment, you know, the ability to, for countries to do censorship persistent payments with each other, as well as, you know, what they hold their money in and therefore, you know, what countries they're exposed to, who can who can seize their funds, that kind of thing, just more diversification. As far as, you know, digital gold, basically, I do get the question around Bitcoin, for example, and the issue is that it's still too small. You know, even though uh, Bitcoin is pretty big 
um, for, for many of us, um, it's still small in terms of, you know, global oil trade is over $2 trillion a year, for example. And we're talking about an asset that's hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, it, it's still small enough that whales can move it. Um, and so basically, I think that as it gets bigger, that does become more interesting because you have a reserve asset and you have global payment possibility. But I think that, you know, people expecting that to happen in a year or two or three, it's premature. And we'll see how this technology matures and solidifies and gets bigger to, to the extent that it might become relevant. And going back to your prior point about stable coins, you know, it's interesting because that's that's also an area that, that's gone against the trend, which is that, you know, central banks are mildly de-dollarizing over the course of a number of years, while stable coins, you know, the... So, so people in Egypt are not de-dollarizing. People in Nigeria are not de-dollarizing, even though many central banks around the margins are slightly de-dollarizing. Uh, so if you look at stablecoin issuance, it's over 99% dollars. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, some of that's obviously DeFi and stuff, but a lot of that, the, the, especially on, on, you know, the lower fee, that's a lot of that is um, these developing market use cases where they want dollars, but they don't trust their local banking system. And... Should the United States uh, support that, um, that I think has run away ahead of it. There, there's still a lot of people out there that want dollars. But in their mind, basically, the more that they support and allow those stable coins to exist, it does, I think, you know, keep the dollar going for a longer period of time because there's more hands out there that, that want to hold it. Whereas if they, you know, if they get super aggressive and they cut off stable coins from, you know, the, the offshore banking system and things like that, that can perhaps further... Um, accelerate the the diversification that we're going to see probably among currencies. So I, I think what timing, what timeline we look out at depends on one technology, you know, the evolution of technology over time, and then two political decisions of whether or not they want they realize certain things, they want to promote certain things, or whether they want to pull back. I think the long arc of time points towards this this becoming relevant on a global scale. It's already relevant for people, right? It's it's, it's relevant for individual Nigerians, individual Argentinians, individual. Uh, people in Lebanon. It, it, it's already kind of a you know global money for people, and the largest pools of capital. It's still you know kind of too small for them. Uh, but I I think you know central bankers and sovereign wealth funds would be insane not to be looking at it and studying it. And you know smaller countries uh, have an edge where they can you know it can be relevant for them sooner than it's relevant for the big countries. Uh, we've seen that perhaps with El Salvador. We'll see how that that story unfolds. But you you kind of see. You know, these rebel countries can kind of get into it a little bit early. We've already seen, you know, probably like North Korea, unfortunately, is, is into it because it, they, for them, it's like a tool. It's becoming increasingly clear that we are entering a great financial reset. So how can we weather these uncertain times? Does Lin have a rebel portfolio prescription for the next regime change? So I think it's going to look different for a 25 year old and a 75 year old. But, you know, I've kind of pointed towards, say, a, a three pillar portfolio, which is one pillar, you know, profitable equities, you know, kind of, you know, 401k stuff. Another pillar of commodity or alternative money exposure. So energy producers, copper producers, steel producers, gold, Bitcoin, that kind of asset. Uh, and then the third pillar is is cash equivalents, T-bills, money markets, things that are, you know, you pay your bills with, that you have like a volatility, volatility reduction that you can then rebalance into the other pillars should there be volatility events. Uh, obviously, younger investors can push out further on their on their risk horizon. Older investors have to be more careful of the volatility they take. You know, a challenge um, in, in our space is that because of how extreme these events are, you have to worry about idiosyncratic events like bans or being severed from financial system, things like that, which is why I, you know, even when someone's very bullish on an asset, they should consider the tail risks and what they would do if certain tail risks materialize and therefore have enough diversification that they're able to recover, they're able to take action, that they can, you know, make use of that as, as it unfolds, even while, you know, na naturally, Wealth tends to be built by taking pretty significant bets, having a vision uh, if you're right, um, whereas wealth is is kept by some degree of diversification. And so every investor, depending on their age, depending on their conviction, their knowledge, they can they can determine how concentrated or, or diverse they want to be. But I, I think that's the, the general thing to do is be focused on these kind of hard assets, things that have real value, um, you know, 10, 20 years in the future, and then just being liquid and being you know, conservative enough to, to realize that it's going to be a volatile journey. I know a person who, you know, left Venezuela um, with Bitcoins, right? You know, they, they, the, the mining equipment was seized. 
but they couldn't get the Bitcoin and you're out. So if you can physically get out, you know, the, the fact that you have this kind of portable, you're, you have access to a portable ledger is, is very useful. And, you know, historically, gold has been that tail risk. Um, and it can be domestically, right? Because you have this asset that doesn't need the internet. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's resistant to all sorts of things, but you can't really bring it globally. You, you, you know, you can't bring a large amount of gold through an airport. You can't, you know, there's all sorts of restrictions. You can only bring small amounts. Whereas what, what makes say something like Bitcoin useful is that if, you know, if you know what you're doing, there's, you know, you're, you're, at, you're tied into this global ledger and value flows more internationally. So I think it's, it's absolutely tail risk insurance, especially for anyone who wants to, to be mobile and have their own self-custodial wealth. Lynn believes that the nature of a multipolar currency world, plus the general downtrend of fiat currencies, will greatly benefit Bitcoin, but it needs time to grow into a large enough market to become relevant on a sovereign scale. What do you think of Lynn's perspective on this? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give us a like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. This is Let's Talk Crypto and we'll see you in the next video.